In the year 2017, Taylor Swift released an album. Anybody know what the title of the album was called? Somebody under 30 should know. <laughs> the album was called Reputation. That was the title of Taylor Swift's album that she released in 2017. And this album was written by Taylor Swift. She writes a lot of her own music. She has a team who helps her. But this album was written specifically to address rumors about various celebrity feuds and relationships that she had been involved in. And from her perspective, it was an attempt to take back the narrative of her life. She was trying to rewrite her reputation. Okay? And I don't think that she was pleased with how she was being represented in the national media or the tabloid media, however you want to look at it. But for better or for worse, she had garnered or earned a reputation. And when you cultivate a particular reputation, it is very difficult to change that reputation. And that's what I want to look at this morning. How do you cultivate a good reputation in the sight of God and of men? How do you cultivate a good reputation? David's rise to prominence involved his cultivation of a good reputation. The answer? The answer is through a wholehearted devotion to God and through practicing the truth that you know about God day after day after day after day. That's how you cultivate a good reputation. I like how Proverbs puts it. In Proverbs chapter 3, interestingly, this was written by David's son Solomon. But in Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon writes this, Do not let kindness or truth leave you. Bind them around your neck, Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and men. And so as we look at the next uh, chronological event in the nation of Israel, it involves David's rise to prominence and it really examines David as a man who had a reputation for loving God, serving God, and obeying God. I want to bring your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you were with us last week, you know that we looked at the first half of this chapter, and that first half of the chapter recorded Samuel's anointing by, or uh, David's anointing by Samuel as king. The second half of the chapter records his rise to fame. And as we look at this and consider this text, the first major point is that your youth is the foundation for your reputation. If you want to be somebody who rises to prominence, your youth is the place where your reputation is forged. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from God began terrorizing him. And then his servant said, Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about that when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Now Saul's disobedience provided an avenue for David's ascension, okay? If you recall from last week, if it's actually just a couple verses prior to what we read today, in verse 13, when Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David, empowering him to do the work that God had called him to. Now, verse 14 says, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit um, came to terrorize him. Saul's disobedience in chapter 13 and chapter 15 paved the way for David's ascension because God had finished using Saul to lead the kingdom of Israel. Now, 
figuratively, spiritually, Saul was done. But he still maintained that position as king. But the way that God took his empowering spirit away from Saul resulted in Saul making decisions for the nation of Israel that satisfied his own fleshly desires, that were not in the best interests of God's people or of God's word, but which were rather in the best interests of Saul. And so this evil spirit came and started t tormenting or terrorizing Saul. Now, first of all, I don't believe that this is a statement regarding Saul's salvation. That somehow he was saved and the Spirit came upon him and then he got unsaved and the Spirit of God left him. I don't believe that that's what this is rec recording right here. Rather, I believe that instead of being enabled to do God's will because of the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, God took that away from Saul and allowed him to flail about on his own. According to his own human wisdom and human insight, and human weaknesses, and human frailties. This evil spirit would be better understood as an angel of judgment. It was God's judgment and God's discipline upon Saul for how Saul had disobeyed him in the previous two chapters. Now Saul's servants had an incredible worldview. They understood that this spirit was from God, that nothing happened apart from the will of the Lord. And so the Spirit came upon Saul from God, and they said, let, the, let a man be found who can be a skillful instrument player, a skillful musician, and let that person play music, and then you will be relieved of the terror of this spirit of judgment. This seems like a good idea to Saul. And so in verse 17, Saul says, <clears throat> Provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Now at this point, one of Saul's servant, servants speaks up and he recommends David to Saul. And look at the reputation that David already owned. Verse 18, One of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, you see, that's the first thing that they were looking for. If he would have stopped right there, Saul might have chosen David. But look at how the description continues. He is a skillful musician. He's a mighty man of valor. He is a warrior. He is one prudent in speech, and he is a handsome man. Now, those are all the physical qualities that you would want if you were a king. You would want somebody who was prudent in speech. That means they thought before they spoke. You would want somebody who is handsome because you wanted to surround yourself with um, elegant and beautiful people. You would want somebody who is a man of valor and a warrior because as the king, you would face many challenges. And you needed the musician to relieve you from the terrorizing spirit. And it's almost an afterthought that the young man says, and Yahweh is with him. It's like the last quality that he lists, but it should be the first quality that he lists. It's okay. We understand, based on our previous studies, that men tend to look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And God didn't allow that to go unnoticed, that David had all the outward things, all the outward characteristics that you could want, but he also had a heart that was in tune with the Lord God. And so here's David, skillful musician, a warrior, a mighty man of valor, prudent in speech, handsome, and Yahweh was with him. And how old was he at this time? How old was he? Maybe 15, 16 years old? Scholars say that he was somewhere in his middle teenage years. So maybe as young as 13, maybe as old as 17. Notice, what kind of reputation did David already have? Let's just say he was 15, at 15 years old. That's a reputation that some adults would long to have. 
And yet here is David, a man of 15 years old, young man of 15, who had this incredible reputation. And it was a no-brainer for Saul to pick David, to come and be the one to relieve him of this terrorizing spirit. And so verses 20 through 23 of 1 Samuel 16 record David's entry into the service of Saul. All right, Jesse, all right, Jesse took a donkey and loaded it with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat, and he sent them to Saul by David his son. Verse 21, then David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Wow. So David's Real life abilities matched the reputation that had been spoken about him. He proved through his actions that the words of his reputation were indeed true. And I think that's a very critical component to forging a reputation. It's one thing to have a reputation in word. It's another thing to have a reputation that has been proven by deeds. And David proved his reputation through his deeds. He was able to soothe Saul's soul when the evil spirit was tormenting him. And this endeared David to Saul. The text says that Saul loved him greatly. And Saul would become refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. This, these seven verses, eight verses, if you're just like reading through the Old Testament, it's really easy to overlook the significance of this story. But I want to point it out for you right now. Your youth is the time where you establish a reputation that will follow you for the rest of your life. Note, why do we say David is a man after God's own heart? <laughs> because he had this reputation from his youth that he would serve God, that he would be devoted to God, that he would practice God's truth, that he would put God's priorities ahead of his own priorities. And this is a lesson that every young person ought to strongly consider. Many people think and many people encourage youth as a time of goofing off, of sowing your wild oats, of having fun and shirking your responsibility. That's what we think about youth in our society. Go have fun when you're young, and then when you get older, you know, you can change. No, it doesn't work quite like that. Once you establish habits in your youth, it's very difficult to break those habits in the remainder part, portion of your life. Not impossible, but difficult. Now, it's obvious to us that the culture of today, the culture that we live in, presents this attitude and mentality about youth. But our culture is not unique. King Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes that nothing is new under the sun. And so people have been promoting youthfulness as a time for goofing off for thousands of years. In fact, nearly 140 years ago, a sermon was given by an incredible man of God named J.C. Ryle. It was given in the Upper Tabernacle in London, and the sermon was entitled Thoughts for Young Men. 1888, not 1988, 1888 is when he delivered that message. And basically, he tells you everything that I just said, except he expounds on it. Young men, don't waste your life. Don't waste your youth. People are going to tell you that youth is a time for goofing off. But I'm telling you, and the Word of God is telling you, that youth is the time for forging a reputation and forging characteristics and forging virtues that will benefit you for your entire life going forward. I would encourage you, if you are young, and let me define that for you, young, under 30, okay? If you're under 30 right now, you're still, you're still a youth. I would say especially if you're between the ages of 15 and 22 or 24, you're a youth. This is for you. You must consider seriously the reputation that you're building right now. 
Are you a reliable person? Can people count on you? Are you timely? Do you have a good work ethic? Those are all external measurements that will shape your reputation. And the world will look at those external measurements. But let me challenge you further. There are spiritual measurements that will demonstrate themselves well, both in the sight of God and in the sight of men. You see, you can have a lot of worldly good character qualities, but not be in God's favor. How is that possible? How is that possible? Well, in the book of Isaiah, we find that all your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And so even if you're a youth and you're like, I'm working hard, I'm doing good, I'm trying to build a good reputation, your good works will never endear you to God. They may endear you to the culture. They may make a good showing at your workplace, but they will never endear you to God. If you want to really have favor in the sight of God and of men, it's based upon the truth of God's word. What's the most critical truth to understand? That every person is born a sinner. And your sin separates you from God. And because your sin separates you from God, you and every other person in this world stands condemned in the throne room of God. And the only way to escape condemnation is to repent of your sins and put your faith in the blood of Jesus, which paid the price for your sins and the sins of every other person. And if you yourself will believe that message, God will save you from the penalty of sin. So if you're young, you can build a good reputation externally by being reliable, being on time, having a good work ethic. But if you want to tr uh, build true favor with both God and men, it starts with personal salvation. Having a relationship with the great creator God. And that is truly what set David apart. He was all of those external things, but he had a personal relationship with Yahweh. And that, my friends, is what allowed him to cultivate such a good reputation. If you're young, you ought to follow the advice that Paul gives to Timothy if you're a believer. Let no one look down on you for your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Don't think that you're too young to serve the Lord. You're not too young to serve the Lord. Look at David. He was like 15 years old. But it was the character qualities that he grew in, that he repeated day in and day out by loving the Word of God and practicing the Word of God that laid the foundation for his reputation. Now, what if you're not a youth anymore? Okay, what if you're above that dreaded 30 cutoff? Okay, age 30 cutoff. Is your reputation not important? Well, no, it is. Of course it is. But after 30, it's a lot harder to change your reputation. It becomes more challenging because people look at your history, they look at your track record, and they say, man, you've got a, you've got a sketchy past. Hard to change. But it's possible. And in fact, one of the character qualities that is required of elders... It's a requirement of elders, but it should be a goal of every person in the church is to cultivate a good reputation in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. It says, you should have a good reputation among outsiders, a good reputation both in the church and outside of the church. So maybe you've done something to mess up your reputation. Don't become discouraged. You can gain that reputation back. It might take hard work. It might take a little while, but you can do that. So a good reputation is formed in your youth, and it will follow you throughout your life. That brings us to our second point that we want to emphasize as we talk about David's rise to prominence, that one event can change your reputation forever. 
Uh, David went from having a, a good reputation, he was well spoken of, to being famous. All right? He went from having a good reputation to being famous. Like so famous that everybody in Israel knew exactly who he was. And let me tell you, that is a lot of pressure when people know who you are because they are watching every move. Why do you think Taylor Swift wanted to take back the narrative of her life? Because everybody was picking apart every little thing that she did and she wanted to set the record straight from her perspective. I'm not saying she's right or wrong. I'm just saying she recognized that her reputation had been tarnished and she wanted to try to address those issues. One event can change your reputation forever. Here we find one of the most well-known Bible stories uh, in the church and outside of the church. Whether you're in the church or outside of the church, nearly everybody has heard of the story of David and Goliath. If you don't believe that to be true, watch March Madness in a couple weeks. Basketball. Okay, I don't really care about basketball, but you watch it. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's true. I don't really care. Um, it's fishing season. How can you be watching basketball? Come on, Pastor Keith. All right. Well, you'll, if you watch March Madness, you'll hear some announcer inevitably say, David just defeated Goliath. You'll hear that in March Madness because some, like number 12 or 13 seed, will upset a high-ranking seed and they'll say, oh, David just beat Goliath. So you know that this story that we're about to look at has a, has a cultural impact thousands of years and many cultures removed after it had happened. So here we find in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David, or not David, but the nation of Israel was being threatened by her enemy. And her enemy was the nation of the Philistines. We were first introduced to the Philistines with Samson. Do you recall Samson in the book of Judges? Note that God said he was going to raise Samson up to begin his wars against the Philistines. And that continued throughout the life of Samson, continued throughout the life of Samuel, has continued through the life of Saul, and now here we find David about to face one of the Philistines. So this has been a long-standing conflict. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes, Daman. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Now what happened as each army was drawn up in this battle array is that the Philistines would send out their challenger and the Israelites were supposed to send out a challenger and the challengers would fight. They would fight. And as they fought, the losing side, okay, so the losing challenger would become the losing side. That side would become slaves to the winning side. Verse 9. Goliath states this. All right, we haven't been introduced to Goliath yet, but this is what he says, verse 9. If this man, the challenger from Israel, is able to fight with me and kill me, we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Now, servants is really a, a poor translation. It should be slaves. All right, they, they were talking about slavery here. You would become a slave or we will become your slave. This was a ritual that was designed to prevent thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers dying and still having a draw at the end of the war. All right, so the Philistines recognized and the Israelites recognized that, yeah, they could have a big battle and kill thousands of each other and still have a draw at the end. And then you just lost all that manpower. You lost all that ability to collect taxes from a family. And so it was a lot easier to just send out a representative from each side. Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. Verses 4 through 7 describe Goliath. And I'm going to summarize it for the sake of time. 
His height was impressive, over nine feet tall. The armor that he wore on his body weighed over 125 pounds. The, sh the spear that he had had a point on it that weighed 15 pounds. And the shaft of the sphere was thick, like a weaver's loom. And his words were insulting to Israel and to her God. Now you recall that Saul was a man who was a head taller than everybody in Israel. But he would have been nothing compared to Goliath. And look, look at Saul's response. Verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. Do you want evidence that the empowering work of the Holy Spirit had left Saul? Here it is. You remember way back in 1 Samuel chapter 11, when the Ammonites came against Israel, Saul was enraged with a righteous anger and empowered by the Spirit of God, and they went and won a great victory? Well, here, the Spirit of God has left him, and Saul himself is terrified, just like every other person in the Israelite army is terrified. The Spirit of God had left Saul, but it had entered David. And David has a faith-based response to this threat from Goliath the Philistine. Skip down, if you will, to verse 23. Goliath had continued to come out and challenge the Israelites day after day. David was serving Saul, but he was not a permanent servant of Saul. So he was going back and forth between watching the sheep and helping Saul when he needed help. I would imagine, and most scholars agree, that a year or two had passed since David first entered Saul's service. So what kind of physical changes happen in a person in a year or two who's 15 years old? You know, they can, they can grow a couple inches, uh, their features change. Um, so David had grown a little bit, but he was still a boy. And he's recognized as a boy. But David comes to bring some supplies to his brothers and to see Saul. And verse 23 says this, As he was talking with his fellow Israelites, Behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. So David heard the insults of Goliath. <clears throat> and when all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. Verse 26, Then David spoke to the men who were standing uh, by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him and told him what would happen. But notice, David had a faith-based response to the threat of Goliath. He wasn't worried about Goliath's height. He wasn't worried about Goliath's armor or the size of his weapon. He said, this guy is uncircumcised, and he is mocking the armies of the living God. We can't let that happen, guys. We cannot let this go on. Why has it gone on this long? I think David's like, wait, wait a minute. Why has this gone on? Well, it had gone on. And it took a man who had a great reputation for loving God to recognize that this was an issue of faith. This was really an issue of spiritual warfare, not physical warfare. Right? People fought with their armies. We learned this way back early in the book of 1 Samuel that the Philistines thought that their gods were more powerful than Yahweh because they captured the Ark of the Covenant. That wasn't true, but that's how they would interpret the action. David rightly assesses that this is a spiritual issue, not a physical issue. Doesn't matter how big and strong and intimidating Goliath is, he has mocked the God who created the universe. When you mock the God who's created the universe, 
guess what? That God can do. He can humiliate you. He can defeat you. He can destroy you if he wants to. But God doesn't do it just by sending down a bolt of lightning. God uses his servants to accomplish his will as they live obediently to his commands. Now, what did David know? David knew the law of Moses. And David knew about the covenant blessings and the covenant curses. That if you obey God, you would prosper and you would defeat your enemies and a, one man would defeat a thousand. David knew that. And guess what? Not only did he have a head knowledge of it, he believed it with all of his being. That God would defeat the enemy that was before him because of his promise. That's the type of faith that we're talking about. That's how David responded. And so in verse 32, David talks to Saul and says, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. Now, I, this sounds pretty arrogant. You know, a youthful, inexperienced young man wanting to go and fight a man who had been a warrior from his youth. That sounds extraordinarily arrogant. But it's not. Why? Because was David trusting in his own strength, his own ability, his own skill? And certainly he was a skilled man. No, he wasn't. He was entrusting himself to the care of Yahweh, the great creator God. And he was entrusting himself that Yahweh would provide the victory. I don't think he knew how, but he knew he would. David says that he'll go fight the Philistine. And again, in verse 36, David brings up the fact that Goliath is taunting the armies of the living God. David then says this in verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, David was not trusting in himself. He was trusting 100% in the Lord to accomplish the victory. Why was David so confident? Because he had seen God deliver him before, when he had to fight the lion, when he had to fight the bear. I don't think any of you would want to let your 15-year-old son, or maybe he was younger at that point, 14, 13, go out in the Tennessee wilderness and get in a fight with a black bear. Okay, that's not, not anything that seems wise. However, David was able to defeat the bear and the lion when he was tending his father's sheep. How? Because he was so skilled? No, because the Lord was with him. And that's what he says. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. I love how David is able to, to translate the praise that should have been due him right onto God. He was able to deflect it from himself right onto the God who saved him, the God who delivered him, the God who was the living God. Saul relents and agrees to allow David go, to go. And so in verses 38 through 51, we, we find David's confrontation with Goliath. And I just want to point out a couple of things here. David and Goliath talked a little bit of trash before their battle, okay? They had some trash talk going on. So verse 42, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him because he was a youth and he was ruddy with a handsome appearance. I mean, here's this handsome, youthful guy. He doesn't have any battle scars on him and he's coming out to fight Goliath who, though he was nine foot tall, probably had some battle scars. And the Philistine says to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Now, David's response, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. David looks right past the physical and again addresses it as an issue of spiritual warfare. You have mocked our God. You have mocked the one true God. God does not like that. 
And so God is going to judge you right here, right now, for all of these people to see and for all of history to remember. Verse 46, This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Again, What's David's emphasis? We are going to give glory to Yahweh because Yahweh is providing the victory. Yahweh is the one who is going to accomplish this incredible feat. I like how David says, this day, this day, this day, over and over again. Like, right now, it's going to happen, Goliath. Like, there's no tussle, and then we go back and lick our wombs and come again. No, today is the day that you will meet your maker, and you will stand in judgment. And Goliath did. We know the rest of the story, that David prevailed over Goliath with a sling and a stone. He, he put the stone in the sling, and he hurled it at Goliath, and it hit him in the forehead, and either it killed him or knocked him so unconscious that David was then able to go and cut off his head. And Goliath died that day. And the entire Philistine army fled. So there was a, a threat to the nation of Israel. And while the whole nation was in fear, David had a faith-based response to that threat. And that one event changed David's reputation forever. It did. And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we find that after David had won this victory, he entered Saul's service permanently, and he became friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And then if you look at verse 5 of chapter 18, it says, David went out wherever Saul sent him, and he prospered. And Saul sent him, set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of all, all of Saul's servants. So David began by entering Saul's service on a limited, temporary basis. But by the end of this section of Scripture, David has become uh, one of Saul's captains of war. And he has gained a reputation that is beyond his little town of Bethlehem. That's beyond even the court of the king Saul. He has a reputation that has gone throughout the entire nation of Israel. And verse 7 says this, The women in celebration sang as they played, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Look at that. They even made songs about him. and He wasn't even the king. David's rise to prominence was now complete. He was well known throughout the entire nation of Israel. And I don't know that David had been a warrior long enough to slay over 10,000 men. But with David in charge of the army, the whole nation believed that they could slay armies of tens of thousands of men because of David. And here we find an important turning point. Verse 8, Saul became very angry, and this, this saying displeased him. And he says, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. These two verses record how Saul's disposition towards David changed. And sometimes there is nothing that you can do personally that will allow somebody to have a good disposition towards you. David did everything right. David ascribed all the glory to God. David wasn't out there promoting himself. He was promoting Yahweh and he was promoting Saul as the king of Israel. And yet, Saul became jealous of David because of his great reputation, because of how prominent he became in the nation of Israel. And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. And this, my friends, is going to lead to a great turning point in the life of David that we are going to examine next week.
David goes from being the man on top in the nation of Israel to being the most wanted man in all of Israel. What an incredible change in a very, very short period of time. Now, in looking over King David's life, we have the advantage of knowing the whole story. You can see that there are really two events that shaped David's reputation in his entire life. We looked at the first today, his victory over Goliath. But there's another event that changed his reputation. You know what that is? His sin with Bathsheba. Two events, two moments in time that present to us alternating perspectives of this man who God says was a man after his own heart. And I want you to be mindful of this, that you can work very hard to cultivate a good reputation. You can do a lot of things, but one event can totally alter your reputation for all time. In David's case, we studied one of the best today, how he's even highly regarded today for his defeat of Goliath. But someday we will study the second, his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah the Hittite. Your reputation is a precious commodity. It must be forged over long periods of time, but it can be shattered in a moment. We should all consider that very carefully as we understand this story and how it relates to us today. I hope that you will consider what your reputation is. Not just what do people think of me, but what do my actions say about me? Because that's what really makes or breaks your reputation. People can say bad things, like Saul. He became suspicious of David. None of those things were true that Saul was suspicious about. But David's reputation was proven by the fact that he continued to act faithfully and obediently to the word of God. Let us be mindful to consider how long it takes to build a reputation and how quickly we can either destroy or enhance a reputation. And most of all, if we come back to this beginning question, how do you grow in favor in the eyes of God and men? How do you do that? It's a day after day after day after day obedience and practice of the Word of God. That's ultimately what will bring you to the point where you have a reputation in the eyes of God and of men that is strong, solid, that is above reproach, and that will provide a reward for you on the day of judgment. Let's pray.